Why do we have to dispose of that? Why do we have to jettison it? Because the true Messiah has come. This is messianic. So we know we were wrong all along. Well, why did the Jews suffer? Kali, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Yeah, hi, my name is Steve. I'm from Pennsylvania. Welcome, Steve. Uh, thank you very much, uh, William and dear Rabbi Tovia. Uh, my question is concerning Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. And uh, the, the Christian apologetics would say that this is uh, an example of someone dying uh, for your sins, because let's uh, in, in, in verse 4, uh, our pains, he carried them. Uh, verse 5, um, with his wounds we were healed. Uh, verse 6, and the Lord accepted his prayers for the iniquity of all of us. And I'm unable to, even though I have your volumes, and I'm looking and I'm trying, but I'm unable to put a cohesive uh, sure. uh, counter argument. Stay on with me, sweetheart. I'm... Stay with me. Just stay with me on this. Uh -huh. Let's think this through together, okay? If you don't mind. Okay. Who is speaking? Well, I'm not up there yet. No, it, so let me just do this. Scroll, but stay, it, it, stay with it, me. It, stay it, with it, me. It, just it, don't worry. I'm not. Don't worry. Just stay with me. Okay. Stay with me, sweetheart, because we need to get through this together. That is the most critical question. Okay. The most critical issue is who is speaking, and if you if you don't know who is speaking, what's that? The Jews, the people after no, his... no, no. The Jews aren't speaking. Try again. Uh, this is this is the whole thing. This is the linchpin. This is why. So who is speaking? I don't know. Good. Okay. I love you. I, forgive me for putting you on the spot, but if That's that correct. if the end if the, this is like going back to Job. If we don't know who's talking, then it opens us up to all sorts of spiritual infection where we just don't know how to respond because we don't know who's talking about who, right? Right. Like, that's like really important. Okay. So who, the Gentile kings of nations are speaking here in their complete astonishment. How do you know? It literally says that. That's how Isaiah 52, 15 ends. So shall he cast out many nations. Kings <gasps> will shut the mouths because of them. Why? Because what had not told them, they'll see. What they had never considered, suddenly they will understand. And they're going to ask the question, <laughs> Who would have believed our report? Whose report? Who's our? What's his pronoun? Our means the kings of nations. It's, how do you know that? It's the verse that introduced, okay? Once you know that the Goyim, the nation that's speaking in the Messianic age, everything makes sense. And without that information who's speaking, as you could well imagine, it's impossible to understand this chapter. I love you. I'll explain it further. Thank you so much for calling in. Thank, Thank you for calling in. Go ahead and hang him down. You bet. Okay. So I, I want to say this to you, my sweet viewers. Just listen. I want to talk you and me. We're just talking, okay? It's a personal, private conversation. Confident. You always have to ask who is talking. And this comes up way too often. Who is speaking? If you don't know that, a lot of trouble. Especially the context is always determinative. And you don't want to speak. You have no clue what's going on here. And I can see that. And, and the church festers. This cancer is sustained by the ignorance of parishioners who don't know who's speaking because they're not familiar with the chapters that surround Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is poetry. It's the fourth of four servant songs. And when a prophet is employing poetry, as Isaiah does in 90% of the book of Isaiah is poetry. 90% of it is. A very dense biblical language. He's not using standard prose. There are very, very few chapters where Isaiah does. It exists, but it's very rare. 
It's only a handful of chapters where Isaiah reads anything remotely like Joshua. When a sefer, when a book is using deploying poetry to convey deeply powerful messages, the context becomes vital or you have no chance. That's why I'm teaching Isaiah. Why? Because it's dense language, it's poetry. So if I wanted to convince you that you shouldn't eat pork, all I'd have to do is go to Leviticus 11, right? And I would show you a verse and you go, okay, I I can't eat pork, right? Because Leviticus 11, there's no poetry. It's all standard prose. These are the signs of a clean animal. These are signs of an unclean animal and so on and bang, 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 okay? Isaiah is nothing like that. So the Gentile kings are speaking here. They are astonished. What are they astonished at? If you don't know this, you can't possibly understand Isaiah 33. Why are they astonished? So this occurs in the Messianic age, and Isaiah 53 is a soliloquy. The kings of nations are bewildered, and they're speaking aloud, astonished. They're shocked. Why? Because Mashiach came. What problem will the non-Jews have when the true Messiah comes? They go, who would have believed this? How did this happen? We were so wrong. That means the Jewish people, God's servant, was right all along. And that's Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant will be held up high. Hine yaskelavdi. Ram Venisa. Israel is the servant. How do you know? Because Isaiah says so. Where? Right here. Which passages? The one that introduce it. Look, we can argue about Isaiah all day long, which we shouldn't. It is axiomatic that the book of Isaiah intended that before you read 53, you read 43. If we don't agree about that, if you disagree with me, then you need to be watching reruns of I Love Lucy instead of wasting your time with me, okay? It is axiomatic that the author of Isaiah 53 presuppose that you read the chapters that introduce it. And if you have not, do not stand on Isaiah 3 and wonder why you don't understand what's going on. I love you guys, but I, I need to say this to you. I just don't know why people would read, I don't know, The Lord of the Rings, I don't know, what, Harry Potter, or go over and over, but a book that, that people believe is the Word of God. People, I, I don't know, but it's like, so. The chapters that introduce it, and what is very important is the immediate chapters that introduce it, which is even more important is these chapters are all connected. They're the servant songs. So if we go to Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9, 42, verse 6, 43, verse 10 and 11. What, remember I said to you, if you know 53, you can presume that Isaiah assumes that you know Isaiah 43, What did I mean by that? Why did I say that to you? Because Isaiah 43 verse 10 says, Atem edai nu mashem, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, avdi ashebacharti. That's all. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. That's plural. Avdi, my exact same word as in 52 and 53, my servant. So is a servant one or many? Good. It's many. Why use the word servant? Because the nation of Israel, although made up of people, have not only a unique bond of a history, but a singular destiny. That's why. It's so simple. So there's not poetry like Shakespeare. This is like poetry means that the language is extremely dense. Okay. It's not poetry like you're just trying to figure out Shelley. It's, it's very, very dense, and there's a, a need to read it in context because if you don't, there's no chance. Just walk away from it. And, and Christians, um, knowingly or more likely unknowingly, 
um, exploit this, exploit it to death. Okay? All right, now we can unpack it. So it's Isaiah 41, 8, 9, 42, 6, 43, 10, and 11. So you should know there is no Savior besides me. I mean, what do you want? 44, 1, 44, 21, 45, 4, 48, 20, 49, 3. The servant is Israel, not once, all over the place. In the singular, you have to get this through your head, Kindle. You have to know who's speaking. If you don't know that the Gentile kings of nations are speaking, and this is a messianic chapter, this is in the messianic age, then you can't possibly understand what's going on here. The Goyim are speaking, and they're shocked. What are they shocked about? They're shocked that Israel was raised up and vindicated at the end of it all, and they ask the question, who would have believed such a thing? And look to who, look who's the arm of the Lord. By the way, you should have, you should have seen it in the text where it says, by his knowledge, my servant will vindicate the just for many. What do you mean by his knowledge or by his prayer? It was through his blood if it's Christian. But that's just, that right away should tip you off. Let's go back. Until the point of the coming of Mashiach, what do the nations attribute the suffering of the Jews to? Let's think this through. Let's be honest. Christians recognize that the Jews, while they don't have a monopoly on suffering, they are the people who have suffered throughout history consistently. We're not the only people that suffered, but you know, it's like uh, what Elie Wiesel said years ago. He said that when referring to World War II, he said, um, not every victim of the Nazis was a Jew, but every Jew was a victim. Okay. So until the Messiah comes, why do the Jews suffer? What do the nations hold? Why do the Jews suffer so much? All the church fathers said it. All the reformers said it. The Jews suffer the nations hold so much because they rejected Christ. Augustine, probably the most important church father, right? He was a Latin church father. His magnum opus, City of God. He has to explain that he wants to explain away a lot of City of God is an apologetic work to explain why Rome fell. But in it, he explained explicitly that the Jews suffer like this because they they rejected Christ and killed him. They all did this. Just for right now, I'm going to say something. Just take my word for it. They all held this. Okay. When Mashiach comes, so until this point, until the point of Mashiach, the nations attribute the suffering of the Jew to the Jew's wrongfulness in rejecting their God, their Savior, their demigod, their prophet, whatever, right? What conundrum faces the nations of the world when Mashiach finally does come? That original question that emerged, then why did the Jews suffer so much? Like, who would have believed that the Jews were right all along? Christianity was a false religion. What? Look how the servant of God, which we have learned is, is, is Israel. So the Goyim are shocked. They're shocked because what they're seeing, what they're finally witnessing is like nothing they were ever told. Please read Isaiah 52.15. Why is 52.15 really important? Because it's the verse right before Isaiah 53. And that chapter break is artificial. The only thing about that chapter break that has value, this is important to get this in your head, is that in Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15, three passages, God is speaking. Very important. So the last three passages of Isaiah 52, God is speaking. In Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 8, God is not speaking. Isaiah is preserving prophetically what the Gentiles will say in a soliloquy when the Mashiach comes. From 9 through 12, those last four verses, God resumes speaking. So if you don't know what I just said now, you— might as well go home. You have no chance at understanding what's happening here, okay? So those are the three sections, 52, 13 through 15, God is speaking. 53, 1 through 8, the Gentile kings of nations are speaking, and they are shocked. 
We're going to discuss that now. And Isaiah 53, verse 9 through 12, God makes a deal with the servant and explains ultimately how the servant will bear out humanity by his knowledge. Let's now go back. Gentiles have a problem when the Messiah comes. What's the problem? How do you explain away Jewish suffering? The Gentiles come to the conclusion, the two following conclusions. Number one, the reason why Jews suffered is why. If I, if I went to Germany right now and I met a really, really nice German, just a really nice fellow, okay, just a, a good guy, and I said, tell me, why did the Jews suffer? How did this happen that all of European Jewry was destroyed during World War II? So a, a really nice, decent German would say, your people suffered. Your great-grandfather was killed in Hungary in the spring of 1944 because of the sins of my people. Jewish suffering is the result of the iniquity of the non-Jews. Okay? Germans routinely admit this. Other nations in Europe routinely deny it and portray themselves as victims as well. I didn't say Austria, but I was thinking it. All right. So, so number one, the Gentiles faced with this conundrum of Jewish suffering have two points here. Number one is the Jewish suffering is explained because we sinned and the Jews carried our iniquities, which means we suffered as a result of our bad behavior. Two. What triggers non-Jews to repent? That comes off here too. I have met, as you can well imagine, many non-Jews that have come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have repented and embraced Judaism, either as just their faith, become B'nai Noach, or convert so that they embrace not only the Jewish faith, but the Jewish nation. They become part of the Jewish nation. As you can imagine, I've met many of these people in my life. What triggered them to do tshuva? Many will tell you because I saw the suffering of the Jew. Many will describe watching Fiddler on the Roof, a, a fictitious story about a very real problem for Jews in the western part of the Russian Empire, the Pale Settlement. Anna Tefka is really a story about thousands of little villages where Jews suffered and were expelled in Eastern Europe. The Ukraine. People tell me that they watched Schindler's List and were mortified by it. Something happened inside of me, they tell me, where it triggered a repentance and a sense of understanding, I need to know more about this Jew. Jewish suffering has the potential to ignite within the soul of a Gentile the desire to cling to the God of Israel. By his stripes we were healed. So Isaiah 53 contains in those first eight passages the expression of the non-Jews, and there are two points that come across. Number one, Jewish suffering, it's not what we used to say and think, that the Jews suffered because they killed our God, our Savior. Why do we have to dispose of that? Why do we have to jettison it? Because the true Messiah has come. This is messianic. So we know we were wrong all along. Well, why did the Jews suffer? They suffered as a result of a horrible behavior. Number two is their suffering triggered within us a repentance. As I showed you earlier on in Isaiah 43, verse 10, 11, you remember one of the things I asked you, can you understand Isaiah 43 if you don't understand Isaiah 43? It's really a rhetorical question. 43, verse 10. Again, it doesn't make a difference which translation you use. It will bear this out. Isaiah switches from singular to plural. If you're using standard prose, that's, you can't do that. If, you're, if it's poetry, not only can you do it, but it's very powerful to do that. So Isaiah is switching from the plural to the singular, and he's going back and forth. Why? I've shared that with you, because it's a singular nation of people. So it's many one. You understand that, right? Well, he does that in 53 as well. And in fact, you mentioned one of them, 
probably without realizing it. And I want to ask you to guess what the church did with that. Isaiah 53, verse 8, last four words, mi pesha ami negalamo. It's the last four words in Hebrew of Isaiah 53, verse 8. This is the last thing, this is the last thing that the Gentiles express in the soliloquy. What does this mean? Mi pesha ami, because the transgressions of my people, negalamo, they were stricken. Well, the church doesn't like that, does it? So translations like the NIV will render it, for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Why'd you change it? So the word lamo, which is the last Hebrew word in that passage. So even if you don't read Hebrew, like you recognize the shapes of letters, you can look it up. It's a three-letter word, and lamo is the equivalent of lahem. It means them. That's all. It's plural. The point is that that is altered. You can't have a plural for the one who is stricken because then we know it's a people. It's not a single individual. So there it is. So just know who is speaking, the Gentile kings of nations. Why are they bewildered? It says so. They can't believe what they're looking at. What do they express the first eight verses? They're talking there. And then God makes a deal with the servant if you'll make your soul a restitution. That means you repent. So these are all the things I'm going to give you, including children, long life. Please read it in context. Remember, Mashiach is coming soon. Please God, I hope, right? They're going to read this to you, and I hope you will understand it, and may that occur quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. Thank you.